Hi, I'm Billy Shore. You're listening to Add Passion and Stir. We're in Washington, D.C. today with my sister, Debbie Shore, who co-founded Share Our Strength and has been part of Add Passion and Stir from the beginning, and somebody who's been part of Share Our Strength from almost the beginning as well, Todd Gray, the chef and owner of Equinox Restaurant, involved with Share Our Strength in the <laughs> earliest days. Todd, thanks for being here. Great to be with you, Bill. Thanks. Uh, and also Congressman Jim McGovern, who, if you do anything in the anti-hunger space, um, there's literally no greater champion or hero to any of us than Jim McGovern, who's represented uh, Massachusetts for, I'm going to say, 22 years Correct. in the House, yes. uh, up for re-election now, as right. the entire House <laughs> is, and you're on a little bit of a House is out of session until right. November. Uh, so we're lucky to catch you in Washington. I'm happy to be with you. Thanks for being here. Congressman, I want to start with you. One of the things I've been thinking about is somehow as I watch you, I listen to you on the House floor, watch you in committee, uh, you somehow wake up every morning with uh, the fight still in you. <laughs> You're such a champion, not just for the hunger issue, but for so many issues that you care about it. Uh, do you feel, as a member of the minority now, maybe the majority soon, do you feel uh, beaten down at all? How do you do it every day? Well, look, I mean, I still believe that for all of the craziness in Washington, that this is still a city where things are possible. And um, and I believe uh, when it comes to the issue of hunger in particular, I believe in the goodness of the American people. I think people want to solve this problem. And sometimes Congress is a little slow, and we're slower than I would like to think on this issue in terms of responding to the great need out there. Uh, but I, um, I, you know, I believe that we will get this done. I believe we will figure out ways to expand uh, our nutrition programs, that we will figure out ways to expand in a constructive way our social safety net programs, and we can end hunger. Uh, this is something that's solvable, and um, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. Um, I would, And if I didn't believe that, I would not have the patience to be here. For as long as I've known you, you've been really literally the champion in the House on this issue. Well, you know, I, I have colleagues I, as well who work on this, but you've been number one. Well, I, you know, I first got interested in this when I was in college. I was an intern for George McGovern, no relation, had a great last name. You know, everybody confuses me with him. They always tell me that they uh, are big supporters of my dad. And when I tell them <laughs> my dad owns a liquor store in Worcester, Massachusetts, That's great. they seem a little shocked. They keep on saying, keep supporting him. But, um, <laughs> but he headed up the uh, Senate Select Committee on uh, Nutrition and Human Needs. That's right. And, um, and he and Bob Dole um, did a lot of um, work in terms of exposing the extent of hunger and food insecurity in the United States. And then they came together and they strengthened, uh, you know, the then food stamp program and child nutrition programs and programs to help older Americans. And, you know, they made this a, a bipartisan issue. Uh, but I sat through many of those hearings and I and it, and it was some of them were heartbreaking um, to hear people who you know lived in the United States of America, the richest country in the history of the world who didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. And when I collected to Congress, I wanted to continue uh, uh, building on the work that uh, McGovern and Dole had done. And, you know, I remember my first week uh, as a member of Congress in my office in Worcester, um, we had a family come in um, who were, were looking for food. Uh, and I, w I, w I would like to be able to say now 22 years later that that was a unique event, but it, 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 it wasn't and it they, hasn't been. They came been. to you really looking they came for to, where do they, we find food? Yeah, where do we find food? Yeah, where do, well, they, I think us? they just, yeah, I don't know if they intended to come to my, my office originally, but they saw that Congressman Jim McGovern and they showed up in my office. But we have people who still come to my congressional offices and in Worcester and, and Lemonster and in Northampton um, wondering, you know, uh, where they can get food. And, um, and again, uh, you know, I, it breaks your heart. It shouldn't be. When you see children who are hungry, it is heartbreaking. I have two sisters who are school teachers in Worcester, and um, you know they, they they're in an economically challenged neighborhood. And the two days that they dread the most are Mondays and Fridays. Mondays because kids come into school, haven't been eating over the weekend, and they have to give them snacks to help them focus. And on Fridays, when these kids come to them and say, and ask them, you know, do you have anything I can bring home? And uh, again, we need to do better. This is this is something that should uh, bring us together and. Uh, and I hope we'll soon get to that day when this is a bipartisan issue and we can actually solve this problem. We, we just had on mm. earlier David Beckman, who's the CEO of Bread for the World. He's a great guy. And, you know, mm. he, he was talking about the fact that we have had some real wins on both global hunger and domestic hunger. As a matter of fact, on the childhood hunger issue, right. 
that you work on with us, uh, we've seen a real reduction in child hu- childhood hunger. So we know that it's about access, right? We know that there's a solution that we need to scale and that we need to do a better job of talking about the wins because it could be so overwhelming for people who, you know, don't understand how this how this issue can be solved, but in fact it can be, and it can be done in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, absolutely, and you guys that share our strength deserve a great deal of the credit for some of these victories on uh, against childhood hunger. But I, th- you know, I, I, I spoke at an event uh, the other day at uh, uh, for Children's uh, Health Watch in Boston, yep. and I was saying, you know, th- there's two things that we need to do better in the anti hunger movement. I think you guys have perfected uh, them both but others need to do it as well. And one is uh, when it comes to fighting for these programs and fighting for these issues, we can't be a cheap date. You know, we can't go into a member of Congress's office and say, oh, you know, hunger is bad and, you know, uh, and I hope you'll join us in ending it. I mean, you're not going to meet a member of Congress who's pro-hunger, right? But yet we have lots of members of Congress who vote to cut programs that increase hunger in this country. And then the, the, uh, the other thing is that we have to tell stories I mean, sometimes we're so inundated with numbers and data and facts and figures that we've lost our human ability to feel them. But when you tell the story of of a child who is hungry, uh, that child's inability to learn in school, um, that child's, uh, you know, uh, you know, inability to develop into a healthy adult and you tell an individual story, you know, whether it's a child or an adult, I think that sometimes resonates as well with with politicians. And it's hard to dismiss it. Yep. Todd, I know this issue resonates with you in a, in a kind of a different way as it does with many of your colleagues. So many chefs are involved with Share Our Strength, and they see the blessings of and the abundance of the food that we have in this country, and they get to feed people who can afford it. But it also, I think, has given them, and I know from your very early involvement and commit, long-time commitment to Share Our Strength, some sense of, um, I want to use my skills and knowledge of food to also give back to those who can't. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I think uh, we're... Just like I said, and I, I hear the congressman talking, I, I think that we are sometimes so removed from uh, seeing a, a hungry child. I think that, you know, we we are around so much product every day, and we're fortunate enough to be able to cook food and, like you say, serve people that are able to to enjoy fresh fish and meat and vegetables. And um, But I think, you know, events like Share Our Strength and so many other events that uh, you really get a chance to give back, I mean, that... I think you know, as a restaurant owner and as a chef, I think that's that's part of our that's part of our mantra. I mean, you have to be integrated into giving back. I mean, because sometimes there there is so much, and we talked about this before our show that you know, and you see people that don't finish their lunch, they don't finish their their dinner, and you know, you see food that comes off the table, and you think, boy, just how can we get that? How can we get that back out there? Is there any way? You know, it's a shame that there is so much food that gets wasted. And, and and this, and I'm just going to say, this industry, the culinary, the restaurant industry, is I can't think of a, a a group of people or business leaders that are more committed to this than those in the restaurant industry. Yeah, I mean I, it's true. I, I think that, you know, I think that depending on your your start date, you know, back in the early '90s when I got the opportunity to work with Roberto at Galileo, and you know, we did start those early days of this is Roberto uh, Dono. Yeah, Roberto Dono. Yeah, yep, and. Uh, you know, going to those, you know, for me as a young chef, I mean, I was a young cook at the time, and um, to go to an event with, you know, 40 or 50 chefs, now there's hundreds, mm-hmm. to be, you know, sort of united in this front where we would, you know, do the event. And I even remember taking the food after SOS, even doing that, and taking it to the D.C. shelter on the way home. And right. mm-hmm. so, what, what was your path to, to becoming where you are today? I know you worked with some of the iconic restaurants in Washington, La Colline, Galileo, you worked with Jean-Louis Paladin mm-hmm. at the Watergate. How did it all start for you? Well, I went to the Culinary Institute of America. I graduated in uh, 1989. But you went because how, like, how you'd I, always been interested. Well, I mean, you knew you were uh, going to become a chef. Oh, we're going to go back that far. Okay, we'll go back <laughs> deeper. Okay. Um, I uh, I went to high school locally. I went to a, a boys' school in Alexandria, Episcopal High School. I got out. I went to the University of Richmond. And mm-hmm. After my freshman year, I just wasn't finding anything that I thought was wasn't excited about sociology and art history, and I don't know. I it's like I told my parents I wanted to take a semester off, so I did, and I went to work for the tobacco company, the restaurant in Richmond, Virginia. It was a, my first foray into a restaurant. Um, at that, you know, I, I got in as a. You weren't a, making cigarettes. No, no, <laughs> okay. they were. They but they had cigarette girls, so it was, it was kind of interesting. <laughs> I was just walking around with the cigarettes around them, you know, and they they had little cigarette boxes. But I started, you know, resetting as a busboy, and then 
fell in love with the restaurant. I knew I knew I wanted to own a restaurant before I wanted to be a chef. And uh, uh, the front of the house was telling me to go to Cornell, look at FIU, look at Michigan, back of the house chefs were like, you should see that go to the CIA and give that a shot. So I ended up going to the CIA, I transferred out of Richmond to uh, go to the Culinary Institute of America and um, came back to Washington in 1989 and was you know told you really should go get a good French training under Robert Grao. He's one of the few master chefs. Well, there's quite a few at the time in D.C., but you know he's a master chef. He's really going to train you and he's going to teach you about you know, how to be a chef and how to make money and how to take care of your product and how to take care of your kitchen. And um, it was a great three three and a half year run with uh, with Robert. And at the time, you know French cuisine was was it. I mean. Uh, you were trained in French, you know, in New York, it was Lutes, it was, uh, it was Le Cirque, uh, you know, Danielle, um, Andre Saltner, and the Italians were coming onto the scene, you know, in the early 90s, and um, I didn't know much about Italian cooking, but I knew I was interested in ch- trying to learn more about it, and uh, that's where I went and worked with Roberto, and I thought I would go there for a year. I ended up staying for almost eight and I became his first American uh, executive chef four years into it. This was at Galileo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, he sent me to Italy, and that's just, um, you know, that's where everything sort of lifted off. And so many chefs in Washington trained under, under either Roberto or Jean-Louis. Yeah. Everybody kind of came from those two. Well, there was, um, there was this little hub, you know, of Roberto, Jean-Louis, Francesco Ricci, Bob Kincaid and Jeff Bubin, you know, those were the players at the time. I mean, they don't have the French guys, but they were the. This was this at least the circle that I was in. And Jean Louis was, you know, this this wild artist at the Watergate who was just his food was so so intense, and he was so intense, and his kitchens were just. I mean, it was all it was all about him and his food, and he was, you know, food first and money second. You know, we always said food's got to taste good first, no matter what it no, no matter what it cost. Well, Congressman, one of the things that we were talking uh, with Todd about a little bit uh, earlier before we went on here was how his restaurant is becoming very, as you, I think you described it, as vegetable forward at Equinox mm-hmm. and much mm-hmm. more focus on that. And I, I noticed that you had just given a, a speech to an organization called the Food is Medicine Coalition, and you and you talked really eloquently about the fact that there's not really a distinction between hunger and health care, that these issues are connected. So what we eat becomes, not, you know, so it's not just an issue of like the access to the food we have, which is a critical issue, but what we eat also is absolutely determinative of our health and probably our success. Uh, absolutely. Look, I mean, when I was a kid growing up and the food bank would do a collection, uh, you know, we'd, we'd go through the cabinet and take out all the junkiest food we had and, you know, donate it to the food bank. I mean, that was the way it was. They took any, anything. And uh, and now um, there's a change in attitude. It's it's now focused not just on food for the sake of food, but on, on nutritious food because you don't want to solve one problem and create another problem. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, my grandmother used to always say to me, "An apple a day keeps the doctor away," and it used to annoy me. I wish she was still alive so I could tell her she was right. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, and you know, and and food is medicine, and um, and you know what we eat determines you know, what, how alert we are. Uh, it also determines, uh, determines our health outcomes in a whole range of areas. We know certain foods can cause disease. We know certain foods can actually prevent you getting diseases. So, you know, when, when we're, we're talking about things like diabetes, right, diabetes, I, you, uh, know, just a whole range you know, I mean, things, right? right. I mean, heart disease. I mean, we go on and on and on. And one of the things we're trying to do is get our health uh, care system to appreciate that more. You know, doctors can write you out food, uh, can write you out prescriptions for you know, drugs, right? Why can't they, why, why aren't we pushing food prescriptions? Are we screening people who go to emergency rooms about, you know, their uh, food insecurity status? I mean, are, are the types of, are we, are we focusing enough on diets? Um, you know, medically tailored meals. One of the number one causes for readmissions to hospitals when people have had major surgeries is lack of access to good nutrition. You know, why, why, aren't, we, why aren't we pushing some of these ideas more forcefully? And I tell people that at the end of the day, if we do this right, um, you not only help improve the quality of life for people, but you'll save a boatload of money. You know, if you want to control healthcare costs, this is one of the ways you do it, prevention. We're, we're trying to find a way 
as we move forward, uh, again, to focus more of the healthcare debate on food as medicine. And I think uh, if we do that, it's a win-win-win for everybody. So doctors would, would mm-hmm. agree with you, mm-hmm. I would right? I mean, a pediatrician would agree with that or any care provider. So why why aren't they screening more intensely? Well, Some a, are, I think, yeah, starting to. Right, but. Right. Well, it's a couple of things. You know, I've spent a lot of time at various medical schools across the country, and I'm always amazed how little attention is given to nutrition in medical education. Why we need to change that. Someone told me the way you change that is you ask more questions on the medical boards about nutrition, and they'll teach it more, uh, whatever it takes. But nutrition ought to be a, more of a focus for, you know, for our, our medical professionals and our doctors. Uh, two, Medicaid or, or Medicaid doesn't cover food prescriptions. So how do you pay for it? I mean, give you a food prescription, prescription drug would be covered. Your your food is not covered. We had to, we had to figure out ways to expand, mm-hmm. you know, coverage for food as a prescription. And also, too, I mean, we, we have hospitals, some hospitals that have food banks, uh, food pantries now, because the, the yeah. population they serve, they know is, is struggling. So culturally sensitive food pantries to be able to make sure people leave uh, with the, with the food that they need. Uh, but, I mean, some of it is having m- medical systems think a little bit out of the box uh, and getting people to think out of the box and try new things, you know, even if they make sense, sometimes is a little bit challenging. So to the extent that we can highlight areas in which it has been done successfully and that people don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, and that you don't have to hire a whole bunch of new people to be able to do this, I mean, maybe we can get others to, to follow suit. One of the things you said in this keynote that was mm-hmm. I thought was just shocking, correct me if I've got it wrong, but I, I thought you had said that one-third of all people who are admitted to hospitals are admitted malnourished. Yeah. Uh, and that as a result, their stays are tend to be like three times as long. Yeah. I guess the hospital gets right. them better nourished. But I mean, right. that's you, pretty you, stunning. You get fed it's in the wild. hospital. No, and, and look, <clears throat> I mean, part of the challenge for us is, um, one, to recognize the problem. And then two, to figure out what to do about it. And one of the challenges we have in Congress is, you know, to fix some of these problems requires some resources being invested up front. You know, I had an interesting conversation with the Congressional Budget Office, CBO, about how they score things. The the cost. The cost of a bill. The cost of a, yeah, right. You know, know, why is it that we can't get them to think a little bit differently when it comes to nutrition programs, like whether it's medically tailored meals or enhancing school lunches or breakfasts or whatever, or providing, you know, uh, uh, food prescriptions. I mean, if we can show you that over a 10-year period of time, because that's usually the duration in which they have to judge how much something's going to cost, that you can actually save money, you know, um, then why would you score it as having being, being a cost? And, you know, their response to me was they're open. They want to learn more about, um, you know, uh, from the data that we've collected and from organizations that have, they can prove that, in fact, some of these investments actually save money in the long run to the extent that they can, you know, feel confident that that's real maybe they're willing to reassess. They change so, everything. Right. So, you know, we're, we're, you know, after this election, we're going to go and try to bring a bunch of people together and sit down with them and see whether this makes sense or not. But I, I do think you do save money. It's not rocket science. I mean, it, and there's lots of studies out there that show it. But if we can, you know, prove that it doesn't cost that much, you know, in terms of our budgetary impact, then I think we have an opportunity to expand these things. And it'll be a lot easier. And Todd, aren't you on a path to, I think you would said, to becoming certified for, you know, 100% waste-free which yeah. when you congressman talked right. about like this takes time this is not an easy right. thing to do yeah. tell us well, what well, that means we've just started the process you know I, I, we were talking about you know we're getting we're turning 20 this year so we're you know what what are we doing and what where can we dig deeper and what more can we do to as we've always been very connected environmentally and this we've started a food recovery we have participated in the food recovery we use it at our museum restaurant the museum of the bible and we do it yes, at the restaurant Ross. called manna your second yeah. restaurant mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're preventing anything from getting, you know, when there's after banquets, we get the food picked up. If there's anything left over that they can take to the shelters. And, and at Equinox, we are working on this 100% no-waste certification. We're meeting with them now when they're coming to inspect the property and they're looking at where we can put the compost bins. It's not as easy in downtown right. Washington on the back of Connecticut Avenue as it might be uh-huh. out in suburbia. But uh, we're working with it and where we can put the bins and... Not only are we excited about it, it's nice when your staff gets excited about it because once you shared it with them, mm-hmm. they were all like, not that we didn't expect they would like not like it, but they were like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Mm-hmm. This is what a great thing that we can be doing. They feel good about it. Are, are you close? Are we close? Yeah, I, I think we might be within 30 to 45 days out, hopefully. Oh, that's close. Yeah. 
You yeah. know, and you know, there's good Samaritan laws that have been passed, so that a lot of people say, yeah. "Well, we can't do this because oh, we'll be sued." Well, we have mm-hmm. we have we, Congress has passed laws that I think provides uh, um, protection for people. Not that you need it; because everyone's going to follow the rules, and it's all all good food. But there's another group too. It's called Love and Spoonful, which is out of Boston. Yeah. I, you know, which I I've been on a, a, a I've traveled with them on some of their runs to local supermarkets where they recapture perishable foods and get it to you know food pantries and you know, uh, uh, senior citizen uh, facilities that provide meals for low-income seniors and uh, for veterans' homeless shelters and stuff. And I think the, the key here is you, if we're going to expand this, you know, uh, we, we're going to need an infrastructure um, to go around and help pick up the food and to and to, um, and to make sure it gets to the right place and it, it gets it, and all the rules and regulations get implemented properly. Um, and that's why, you know, if we had a different Congress, I would be we'd be talking about a farm bill that maybe expanded USDA to maybe include a special office to deal with uh, food waste, mm-hmm. because it's such a huge problem. I mean, so we were told it's like forty percent of what we grow or what we produce we throw away. You know, if you go, I, a couple of years ago, I went to a supermarket, a chain supermarket in Massachusetts, and was looking in the dumpster until I got chased out um, because I didn't know what I was doing. But I just wanted to see what was, was there. I mean, you know, it, it, it was filled with hummus and, and, you know, all kinds and eggs and stuff that were totally fine, right? So expiration dates are also not, a, I mean, not that right. we don't want to tell people to go eat no, things that are right. way past, but they are very conservative about they are. expiration dates. Well, but, or their best buy dates, or more than expiration, their best buy dates yeah. that are mandated not by the federal government, by, but different states have different rules. And, you know, and I think those best buy dates oftentimes are viewed by consumers as an expiration date. I mean, I always tell my mother, she throws her milk away when it says best buy this date. When it hits that date, she throws it away. So, no, the, the test of milk being bad is if it smells so bad. It. I mean, eggs have, you know, uh, incredible longevity, uh, but they're taken off the shelf, you know, prematurely. So, look, I, you know, I just think that food that is perfectly fine and good and healthy and nutritious ought not to be thrown away, especially with the amount of food insecurity and hunger in this country. And I always tell people, the people who are hungry are not just, they don't, they don't fit a stereotype, right? It's not home, just the homeless and jobless. It's people who are working. It's young kids in school. It's people who you pass on the street who look like, you know, everyday people, but they may be struggling. Uh, one of the other things I've heard you say many times about hunger is that hunger is a political condition. Yeah. Right? It's not a, I believe a, shoot, that. a food right. shortage right. condition. What do you mean, when you say that, what do you mean by that? I, I mean, we have the food. We have the money. We have the, you know, knowledge of what we need to do to end this problem. We have the infrastructure. We have everything but the political will. When Congress wants to vote to go to war, all everyone rises to the occasion, and co- you know, cost is no, you know, detriment, and we just go to fight some country in some far off land. We don't think twice about the cost of you know a, a tax cut for corporations, but we we can end hunger. I mean, this is a solvable problem. This is this is not that difficult. And you know, for some time, and you know, I, you both know this. I we we tried uh, during the Obama administration to get them to do a White House conference on food, nutrition, and hunger because I mean, to solve this problem, you have to look at this holistically, right? It's not just recapturing food waste or expanding SNAP. There's a whole bunch of stuff. But, you know, we ought to have a plan and we, with, with, with benchmarks that we can measure. We ought to then go ahead and implement it. It just seems to me that it's the right thing to do. It'll save us a boatload of money and, and other costs. I mentioned I spoke at Children's Health Watch uh, event the other day in Boston they just did a study with the Greater Boston Food Bank that says that the hunger and food insecurity in Massachusetts costs about $2.4 billion a year, billion with a B, in avoidable health care costs. That's just Massachusetts alone. I, I look at food, like I think all of you do, as a fundamental human right for everybody. I mean, it should be that way for everybody on the planet, but certainly in this country, when we have plenty of it um, and we have the resources to make sure everybody gets enough to eat. And so, you know, we ought to we got to make this a priority. You know, we need to be tougher. Um, you know, take a page from the National Rifle Association. Yeah. I vote for gun control. That you know, they bre- they're screaming at me constantly. Well, people who vote to cut food and nutrition programs don't usually suffer a political consequence. They get reelected oftentimes, and we need people to lose their elections if they're making hunger worse in this country. That's what's left is. Not just a like a strong voice, but like a consistently loud screaming voice, the way some of these other lobbies Absolutely. get what they want. 
Well, one of the things we should say, because uh, there's an election, midterm elections are just five weeks away, uh, and I would say virtually every issue that we've discussed so far, whether it's food waste or healthy food or hunger, uh, will be impacted by the election. And mm -hmm. so people need to vote. We're not going to say who to vote for or which party or which candidate, but voting is important. And as I think most people know, only about half of registered voters or half the eligible population votes. So getting out to vote in the next five weeks is going to be key. Congressman, you'd mentioned uh, that if we had a new Congress, we might have different types of policies at the USDA with an election five weeks away and a lot of folks predicting that the House will switch from Republican control to Democratic control, outside chance of the Senate. Uh, you potentially could become one of the most powerful members of the House of Representatives. Why is the Rules Committee so important? Well, the Rules Committee is like the traffic cop of Congress. Every bill that goes to the House floor goes to the Rules Committee. And we decide uh, sometimes what the basic text will ultimately look like before it goes to the floor, whether it could be amended or not, uh, whether you have to vote up or down, or whether... Or, or it may not go to the floor. Or it may not go to the floor, but uh, but it's, a, it's, it's kind of the last stop before it goes to the floor. So if there's any anti-hunger uh, initiatives in any bill, believe me, I'll do everything I can to stop it. <laughs> when you think about that? Do you think about, um, do, you, do you have to suppress kind of like an impulse, like now I'm going to get revenge on these guys who have been torturing us, or now I'm going to be able to set an agenda that's progressive for this country, or a little bit of both? How do you think about it? Well, I, I'm, I don't in, I'm, in, put the I'm in therapy the to deal with my anger, <laughs> of, of my resentments, but I got to, no, but, but look, here's the deal. Um, you know, I, I think um, if things change, um, we have an opportunity to do some good things. I mean, look at the House Farm Bill. It's 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 a cruel document. I mean, it cuts SNAP by billions of dollars. It throws millions of people off the benefit. It will throw hundreds of thousands of kids off of uh, free breakfast and lunch in school. I mean, who, who how can anybody, I don't care what your political philosophy may be, how can you endorse that kind of a bill, right? At a minimum, I think that kind of cruelty stops. And it is cruelty. I know it's hard language and harsh language, but I said I'm the ranking Democrat on the Nutrition Subcommittee. I sat through 23 hearings that the majority insisted on having on the SNAP program, and I went to every one of them from from the beginning to end. And none of these people, including the witnesses that the Republicans called, suggested anything like what is in the House bill. This this House bill will do harm to a lot of people in this country. So and you're saying the House bill went beyond what their own expert witnesses said. Right. Yeah. I mean, their, their own policy. experts. The own. I, actually, the, here's the good news: the, the 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 Republican experts agree with us. You know, um, I mean, <laughs> we're on the right side. We're the mainstream, mm -hmm. and part of it is because they base it on facts. When we talk about people who are struggling in poverty or who are battling with hunger, you know, um, there's a there's a narrative out there that's being pushed. That doesn't reflect the reality. So, all oh, these people, all they need to do is work. Well, of those who can work, the majority do work. They just earn so little, they still qualify for the benefit. And by the way, the majority of people on SNAP aren't expected to work. They're kids. Now, I guess you could repeal the child labor laws, but they're kids. They're senior citizens. They're people who are disabled. You know, the, the stereotype out there, you know, that uh, it's just not accurate or that this, is a, this pr promotes a life of dependency. The average person is on SNAP less than a year. And there's lots of success stories. During a previous farm bill, we brought up to the Hill people who graduated out of SNAP. You know, they're, they're, they're Wall Street leaders in the financial service industries. They're big lawyers. They're, they're heads of companies. They're, you know, uh, brilliant academics. They're medical researchers. I mean, and they all came up to tell members of Congress that during a difficult time in their life, this program was, was helped them. And they came up to say thank you and basically say your investment in me paid off and you need to know that. And I think, you know, we, we need to somehow move beyond this position that uh, so many seem to be stuck in where, you know, we, we, we talk about people in poverty, you know, in, in ways that diminish their struggle or we scapegoat them or we shame them or we blame them. And I mean, it's, it's, it just has to stop. We need to refocus attention on how we end hunger, how we solve some of these problems. And I'm hoping that, you know, we can help, you know, steer the conversation in a different direction. And I'm under no illusion, you know, uh, given who's in the White House, that we're going to be able to get everything we want. But at least we're, we're not going to put forward a farm bill that increases hunger in this country. You know, we're going to do our best to try to end hunger. Todd, you're 
uh, not a politician. You're a restaurateur and a businessman, but you have a restaurant now turning 20 years old, Equinox, that's probably one of the five restaurants closest to the White House in the whole world. Do you feel like you have to kind of suppress your own political views? Obviously, your restaurant has to be a place that's open to all and welcoming to all. And do you, and as a business person, what do you hope for in terms of like, how do we heal these divisions that have seemed to have become so deep in our country? Restaurants are places where people come together, right? Absolutely. You know, it should be a safe haven, you know, and, and uh, boy, um, you know, in the 20 years of operating uh, right across the street from the White House, I mean... I, You've had everybody in there, yeah, right? Everybody. And, and I don't think that, you know, there's, the room is full of people from both parties. It's not, you know, we're not a sort of a restaurant of, the, of, of that administration, but I mean, we... We're, uh, we, we are there to feed people and give them great meals and a good place to feel comfortable and feel safe and feel protected and respect their privacy. But to answer your question, we are very, you know, we're a bipartisan restaurant, you know, and I just, I just like when people come in to eat. We just want people to come and eat and, and, and be able to feed them and make them feel good. I, you know, Places where people can talk. Uh, people of yeah. differing views can talk. I know yeah, one of the things right. Danny Meyer it said about this at that time when there was some controversy over, like, would you, you know, um, would you not serve an administ- a high-ranking administration official? Danny said they might be coming in to talk to somebody with a different point of view, mm-hmm. and this might be the place where they actually are able to have a, a meeting of the mind. So that plays an important role as well. Mm-hmm. Congressman, separate from kind of the policy agenda, um, and, and this is a conversation we're having right in the midst of the Kavanaugh the Supreme Court confirmation hearing where it seems like uh, our, our divisions might be become all but irreparable. Do you see a way to get Congress back to, I guess, what John McCain called regular order? Do you see yeah. a way to, uh, is that 10 years off? Is it 30 years off? No, I How hope, do we it's, get there? I, I hope it's, it's coming soon. I mean, uh, one of the things that, one of my responsibilities as chairman of the Rules Committee is to help put the rules package together for the first day of Congress. And one of the things that I want to do, if, if I'm lucky enough to be chairman of the Rules Committee, is bring back regular order. Bills should go through committees. There should be hearings. There should be markups before they come to the rules committee. You know, too so many bills. Se- so there's a set of rules that right. everybody understands. Yeah, and yeah, plays yeah by. right. Like, and every member ought to be empowered. You know, uh, if you have an amendment uh, that's germane to a bill, you ought to have it made in order, even if it's an amendment I disagree with. We shouldn't be afraid of fair fights. I mean, this is the people's house. People have different points of views. They ought to be able to bring their ideas to the floor. You know, we do, we can't have chaos, so we have to have some structure. But, uh, you know, if you have an idea that's j- legitimate and germane, you know, I mean, I'll fight you fight you on the House floor. And if you get the most votes, you win. If, you know, you don't, I win. But we ought not to be afraid of a fair fight. I think, you know, restoring regular order so that it's, you know, so that average members have more of a say in how the Congress works, I think we do a, go a long way to restoring civility and mutual respect. Right now, what's happening is too, everything is top down. I mean, we, you know, I, when I first started working on the Hill, uh, you know, a gazillion years ago for Joe Moakley, who was the chairman of the Rules Committee, from, he's from Boston, you know, uh, there were very few totally closed rules where nobody could offer amendments. Now the majority so of bills a closed rule is, a, 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 is a bill that you can't nobody can amend up it. or down, no amendment, limited debate. Now it's the majority of bills. I mean, we, we, we have broken every record. We, we, we're the, right now we're the most closed Congress in the history of the country. I mean, that's where we are right now. And, uh, yeah, you can force things through and shove things through, but it's just not good for the democracy. And then and, the other side's going to want to do the same thing when and they're well, in and, power. And, and this is the problem. You know, as I've been telling my colleagues on the Democratic side, if we're fortunate enough to win, we can't behave like that. This is yeah. not right, yeah. right? And it may mean we lose a couple. You might have to take a couple of tough votes. But this is not the way – you know, go back and read our history. This is not the way the People's House is supposed to run. And – and I'm also a believer that process is re- directly related to policy. You know, if you have a lousy process, you probably have a lousy bill. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of issues out there that that need to be addressed. You know, we had these uh, these young people uh, who came to Washington uh, protesting gun violence, and I met with you know like, you know hundreds of thousands of young people came. It was so inspiring. A group came to my office, and they were they were really shocked to learn that the issue wasn't getting you to vote for or against the bill. The issue was that the leadership wouldn't allow any bills to come to the floor. Right. Important issues ought to be debated and discussed. I, we're, the, we're supposed to be the greatest deliberative body in the world, and I have this radical idea that maybe every once in a while you ought to deliberate. 
Um, and so it shouldn't be that controversial. Yeah, um, and my my guess is that nobody outside of Washington knows what you just said, right? Yeah, probably yeah. very few. But you unless know, they're you I, know close I, to the political I, system. So when I speak to groups at home, people that like me and people that don't like me, you know, usually everybody seems to agree on two things. One is that there's too much money involved in politics, you know, because all pe- members of Congress do is raise money to pay for campaigns, and it's ridiculous. And then the other thing is when you say Congress is dysfunctional. Well, the way to make Congress functional again is to have regular members, including freshmen, who have good ideas, be able to bring them to the forefront and debate them and, you know, and have their vote. I mean, I mentioned, I'm on the Ag Committee. We're talking about the Farm Bill as it relates to nutrition. We sat through all these hearings, so that was a good thing. We have all these hearings. But then the actual language that cut SNAP by billions of dollars just materialized out of thin air. Nobody wants to take credit for writing it. I, I don't know some right wing think tank or the white somebody handed it and it just appeared and and that's and that's the primary language <laughs> and of the that's bill. the language that's of the, the bill, bill now and it's like you know where did it come from and you get Pretty blank wild. stares. Um, so t- two last things as we um, start to wrap up here in terms of the issues that you both care about from uh, Todd from hunger to the environment to food waste, um, Congressman, a whole range of issues. We've only talked mostly about hunger here, but you're involved in a lot of other issues as well. Uh, For the average American, what's the best way for them to get involved, have an impact on the things that that you care about? Um, How would you think about that, Todd? People come into the restaurant, they make choices. The the market, in effect, uh, you know, has some determination uh, on some of these issues. But what's the best way for people to to get more involved? Well, I think that, you know, getting involved in... um, uh, some type of local community-driven events that can, obviously, there's community food banks, things that I think that are out there that people are not aware of, that they can get involved with, and that they can do on their weekends and for the food drives and anything that can be done, obviously, for our shelters. And see uh, the tangible impact, as Debbie was saying before, right? You can just yeah. see that impact. And I think that sometimes getting out of that zone that you're in and, and, and going to that other frontier and taking a look at really what's there and, and, and sort of the, the, as we said, you know, the, the scary, you know, reality that's out there that people are struggling. And to get out and to, to try to, to there, are, there are lots of programs people can sign up for that can, that are, you know, very community-based and local community centers that can also like, give you some uh, direction in that. But to get out and do things for people that are less fortunate. Congressman. I agree with everything Todd said. I mean, you know, it, you know join organizations, support organizations, um, that uh, share your beliefs and convictions. I mean, uh, you know, you get the No Kid Kid Hungry program with Share Our Strength. I mean, it's an incredible effort that's making a real difference. People who care about this issue should, you know, Google you and, 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 and support you. But I also tell people that you should know your own power. We all have power. Uh, and sometimes we sell ourselves short. I, I think about what, what's, you know, what, in the midst of the Kavanaugh hearings, think of those two women who I'm confronted just gonna uh, say that. Jeff Flake yep. in the elevator. That that basically got him to you know you know adjust his views on uh, how, how the senator should present. And ask for the FBI minister. I mean, that would not have happened if it weren't for those women. I mean, um, so people need to use their voices and speak up to their elected officials at the local, state, and federal level. Elected people are supposed to work for people. People don't work for elected officials. You know, and you know, uh, as I began in terms of how people should, you know, lobby members of Congress. Don't be afraid. You know, to draw a line in the sand. I don't want everybody to be a single issue voter, but if somebody's voting against your values or somebody's not representing your values, you ought to let them know. And I'll let them know there's a consequence to that. What makes an impact on you when a voter talks to you in terms of like if you're if you really haven't made up your mind or have, have voters cause you to rethink some yeah. of your issues? Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be two sides I mean, a, for anyone who comes right. in with a right strong right. case. Somebody else will have the other side. Yeah, I think what I appreciate is when people come in, you know, and engage in a way where it's, you know, more than just a bumper sticker, where they tell yeah. a story, where they tell me their experiences. Look, I, I you know, I, I've had a, I've been lucky in my life. I haven't, I've, I've not struggled in poverty. I've not had to have some of the hardships that a lot of the people who come in and see me have dealt with. Um, but I need, the only way I can know about them is if people tell me, you know, and sometimes things seem one way and then you hear from somebody and, and they re- and you realize it's more complicated. I didn't think of that. I always tell people, uh, and this may come as a shock to people, but intelligence is not always a prerequisite for serving in Congress. So sometimes people <laughs> don't know, right? You gotta, you have to, you, you have to educate us and you have to, 
you know, remind us of what the realities are. And I, uh, but I think people have power. It's when they don't use their power that's really frustrating to me. Okay, last question. It's always the hardest. I'm going to let you go second, uh, Congressman McGovern, so you have oh, a chance geez. to think Thanks, about Bill. it. Oh, yeah. oh, no, this is going to be an easy one for you. Uh, and it's Soft about, because uh, it, Ad Passion and Stir listeners are into food, and we want to know, uh, other than your own restaurants, and I want you to tell us just 20 seconds worth about manna as well, because it's, it's a pretty mm-hmm. cool concept. Um, what's a hidden gem in this Washington area that uh, if you were going to go out to eat, maybe it's not reviewed, maybe it's not one of the, the fancy big name restaurants, where would you where would you go? Oh, let's see I here. Know, that's a hard one. Well, um well, I don't know, hidden gems, my gosh. I mean there's so much publicity around every restaurant that's opening up. I mean they're you know, they're talking they're promoting it before the doors open, so I don't know how many hidden or gems. Or even your go to. Yeah, do you and Ellen yeah, have a go to? Yeah. I mean we live up uh, off of sixteenth street, so we we like our Mount Pleasant and we like our we like our uh our Adams Morgan area. You know, I love Ellie. I, you know, we've been to Ellie a couple times. Over it's, the new, Mount it's the old Heller's Bakery. Ellie, yep. Bill. got it. Okay. In it's like, Mount Pleasant Street. It's like okay. one of the closest restaurants to us. You know, it's kind of a convenience. We love, um, you know, and Adams Morgan. We, we, we like some old favorites too. We haven't, you know, we love going up for sushi to Perry jump on the rooftop. Yeah, that's you fun. Know? You know, that's always a good time. I mean, we love, I mean, we've been to Himitsu. Love Himitsu over there yeah. off of Upshur Street. All my yeah. sister's favorites. I yeah. love that restaurant. Tell us a word about Mana. So, man, cool uh, yeah, we opened up. It'll be a year in November, December 10th, and uh, uh, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, fast casual in the Museum of the Bible, flatbreads, lamb meatballs. You should check out Sababa for, oh, it, I, uh, you've probably already been oh, there. Oh, yeah, of yeah, course. No. Yeah, I got that one early. Israeli. Yeah, check uh, it, yeah, yeah. And you're open for long lunches from 11 to 4? 11 to 4.30. Come see us, and... Uh, Come see us for plant-based brunch. I'm trying to, I'm, no one gets scared with that word, okay? Come see us for plant-based brunch or good plant-based menus at Equinox, and uh, I'd love to see you. Congressman, you and Lisa have a, a go-to? In, in D.C.? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we, we live on the, on the hill here, so what, what we, I mean, we, we hang out at uh, Henry's La Plaza restaurant across oh, yeah? the street here, which okay. is great Salvadoran food. Uh, we go to Mr. Henry's. I like to sit outside. They have a turkey club with real turkey in it, um, <laughs> you know, and um, we... Uh, uh, we've been to Aquel Due, Trattoria, Alberto, which is uh, right on Eighth Street. Um, I used to love the Banana Cafe, which I used to do all my swearing in parties there, but they 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 closed. <laughs> Usually, we're in session late, so you, you have to find restaurants that are open late. There's some really really nice fine restaurants as well along Pennsylvania Avenue here today. But there's no shortage of, of wonderful places. I like to eat at Easter Market uh, yep. uh, at their uh, Cario place as well. Um, so some really wonderful food. Here in D.C., and I get some incredible restaurants in my district, the second district of Massachusetts, which goes from Worcester all the way out to Northampton. Yeah, tell us Riva. one that we should know there. Oh, I, 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 just, I, I remember I, a lot of great bakeries in Northampton. The times uh, I've been through there. Oh, there's wonderful places. But I, if I started, if I named a restaurant, yeah, yeah, no, I, you, I, you I don't want to lose votes. Then, I, then I'm done. <laughs> right, okay. I'm done. You're done. Yeah. Uh, thank you so thank much, you. both great. of you. Todd Gray, longtime just supporter of Share Our Strength champion, and iconic restaurateur here in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and Congressman McGovern, a first, a potential uh, chairman of the Rules Committee on Ad Passion and Stir. Um, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, and Debbie Shore, yeah, as always. Uh, and our producer, Paul Whittle, Woody, in the control room, uh, Kelly Griffin, and the whole team at Share Our Strength. Uh, I'm Billy Shore. You've been listening to Ad Passion and Stir. Ad Passion and Stir is distributed by District Productive. Our executive producer is Peter Ogburn. Ad Passion and Stir is the creation of Billy Shore, Debbie Shore, and Paul Woody Woodhull. I'm Billy Shore. You're listening to Ad Passion and Stir from Share Our Strength.